The Paris Air Show is back underway, the first one we've had since 2014. How does it feel? Yeah, uh, I feel good. Um, it's very dynamic. Everybody's here this year. It's incredible. Uh, we didn't think six months ago that we would have such a wonderful show, so much positive energy. So yeah. we're very happy to be at the show. Let's talk about how good it has been. Um, we've just seen the confirmation. Alex was just talking about it. 750 firm orders now at the show. You've got the Indigo order and you've got the Air India order, which we've just seen confirmation of. There is talk maybe amongst those that are not ordering, that this is turning into a frothy market, that some of these airlines are starting to overorder because they're worried about the availability of slots. What do you say to those people? Uh, for Indigo, um, that uh, was uh, announced yesterday. Uh, this is a 500 planes order. That's the biggest order ever in terms of number of planes, but that's for the long term. And we've seen with Indigo that they've been executing on their plans. They're very successful in India. So these are not speculative orders. These are orders for the real need of uh, the growth that we see in India. So I think there is a lot of substance behind those orders. Uh, it doesn't change the, the short term perspective on ramping up the production because these are long term orders. So I think it reflects the fact that planes are scarce resources, but it's also reflect growth, that is a reality, and it reflects long-term perspective and planning of airlines. So I think this is a healthy uh, perspective on the long-term future of aviation. When we saw that order, one of the questions that was asked was, why is Airbus selling so many planes to Indigo? And hear me out on the logic. You are tying up a huge amount of your manufacturing capacity with one big order. An order that you could have sold and broken up into component parts and probably sold those slots, those aircraft, for even more money. Why, why one big order when you could have had lots of smaller orders and probably made more? I don't think it's either or. Um, we've taken an order with Indigo for deliveries between 2030 and 2035. So this is really a long-term perspective where we still have a lot of space uh, in our skyline. So the, the production is not sold out for those years and it provides room for other orders to come later. Now, Indigo has been a very, very reliable partner for Airbus and uh, vice versa. So we want to continue to stick to each other and uh, continue that very successful story in the future. You talk about the fact that this is going to be, these are going to be aircraft that are going to be delivered well into the 2030s. How far away do you think we are from Airbus selling its last A320 Neo? We are very far away from that. You think? It's going to be a very successful product for many, many years to come. It will be it'll, the airframe. I think. I think you first. I think the first commercial service was 1990. This is this is an airframe that's been around for a while, and we're getting near to the point where we are going to be talking about the next generation. I think we are far from the point where the uh, A320 can go, but you're right in saying that we need to plan for the next uh, generation of planes. We have a decarbonization uh, roadmap that speaks for uh, carbon neutrality by 2050, and to reach that point, we need to continue to reduce the full burn very significantly. Yep. The next uh, stage will be with 20 to 30 percent less fuel burn and therefore less CO2 emissions. We think this is going to come between 2035 to 2040 for entry into service. So we are already looking at technologies yeah. for that next wave of planes. The next wave of planes, maybe the, maybe the wave after that, is likely to be based on a new engine architecture. It could be ultrafan, it could be open fan. But what we're going to be looking at is a starting point with a new type of engine. And you're going to have to build the airframe around that new setup. It's a bit like the, the A400M. You, you built a new airframe and a new uh, engine, you had a new engine at exactly the same time. When, we th when you extend that logic, the logic slightly takes us in the direction of why don't you just vertically integrate so that you can control what the engine technology is going to look like, how that decision is going to be made, and how the airframe is going to fit around that, rather than have the confusion of an engine manufacturer effectively making a whole load of decisions for you. And, and the direction of travel in this conversation, if I get there eventually, will be, why don't you buy Rolls-Royce's engine business? 
Uh, we are discussing about the next generation of uh, single aisle airplane, and yeah. we are uh, designing, we are developing, we are reviewing the options with the engine manufacturer. Yeah. Uh, you refer to the A400M, that just highlights the fact that we can cooperate between engine manufacturer and uh, aircraft OEMs in an efficient way, and we can test options with one engine manufacturer and test another option yeah. and other ideas with another one, so it provides optionality for uh, the aircraft manufacturer. Uh, at the moment, we are uh, well uh, in the um, development of the RISE uh, technology on the engine side, but as well on the integration. You know that there is a close yep. cooperation between Airbus and CFM on RISE to see how this could deliver a very good solution for this 20 to 30 percent fuel burn reduction. But we're also looking at other options. And when you don't vertically integrate, you have this optionality. If Boeing, your competitors, were to decide that they were going to go with open fan technology, would they be making the decision for you as well? Engine commonality is a big feature of this industry. What you're saying about Boeing could apply to Airbus, and we are, we are in that cooperation with, uh, with CFM. Yep. So we are, I think, pacing the, uh, the, uh, the story on uh, what's going to be the next um, uh, engine. So it will be your decision, do you think? Yeah, yeah. we are looking at ourselves. We are uh, anticipating into the future. We are investing in new technologies. We are partnering with yep. uh, new partners, existing partners. We have a very strong uh, uh, cooperation based on trust with CFM on the RISE engine. So we are moving forward at pace and um, the others will have to do what they think is appropriate for them. We move forward. You're going to have to build much more efficient aircraft because there's likely to not be much SAF around. Is there going to be enough SAF to fly all the aeroplanes that you're selling right now? So we start from a very low point in terms of uh, use of SAF today. It's below 1%, yep. and we want to be coming close to 100% by the 2050. So there are at least two reasons why we need to reduce fuel burn. It's because there will be a limited quantity of SAF, at least at the beginning, before this industry is scaling up. Uh, but it's also going to be a more expensive fuel. And if you want to have an economic equation that works, you need to reduce the fuel burn to continue to have uh, tickets that will be affordable. So these are two good reasons to reduce very significantly the fuel burn of the uh, airplane of the future generation and in spite of the growth of aviation growth in number of planes uh, having the emissions of this sector uh, going down that's a big challenge uh, ri rising the quantity of SAF is yeah. an ingredient but to make it economically viable each and every plane needs to be burning less fuel less SAF I've just been told I've got two minutes left so I'm going to do a, I'm going to do a quick fire round with Guillaume Fauré um, is there enough demand for two engines on the A220? We will look at that question when we will be considering the 500, which means the next um, yep. version of the 220. We are not yet there. Uh, we think it makes a lot of sense to have one more um, um, child in the family the 100, the 300, and the 500. I think we would be wrong to be right too early. We're not yet at that point because yep. we're still ramping up the initial phase of the program. But when and if we get there, but it's more when than if, uh, then it will make sense to have two engine options on that plane. That's what we would like to consider. Obviously, we need to have the engine makers uh, agreeing on the fact that it's a good idea. And again, we are not yet there. Pratt Whitney is not convinced that it is a good idea. It doesn't see necessarily the demand for uh, such an idea, but I guess it's sole supplier on that aircraft right now. So they are, they are <laughs> having skin in the game today. And, uh, yeah. But obviously, they are our today's uh, partner on the 220. We are very yeah. happy with the partnership. But having one more plane in the family makes it a big family. And there's maybe uh, room for two engine uh, makers. Yep. At least that's what the, the customers, that's what the airline think. And therefore, I have sympathy for the idea. Final quick question. When are we going to see the A21 XLR getting certification? It's going to be entered into service in the second quarter of next year. Entry into service Q2 2024.